Welcome everybody to the, this first session. Uh, it has been a particular journey. Yeah? I will not uh, make a long introduction about it, but imagine that uh, a couple of months ago, we were all supposed to really do three different, four different steps, uh, helping our different regions to, to upgrade their skills, uh, to co-create uh, throughout the borders and to try to empower local projects by learning from each other and we had to turn it suddenly uh, into an, an online scenario and i must think that i must say that uh, as well kiev and certainly espo as uh, brussels we have shown quite some yeah, creativity and resilience to make sure that we could switch over to an uh, online modus uh, or scenario in which you are all a bit invited now and all participating and i guess it, it will remain a particular experience i have been teaching the last weeks and months online using the zoom platform for several mba programs but also for other trainings and it, it remains a particular experience because we see each other not all uh, we listen uh, we cannot interact all the time as we would love to interact but uh, let's, let's just take it as a huge opportunity that once upon a time in your life experience and profession or career, you will be able to look back at it and say that in 2020, from June until October, November, you went through uh, an entire uh, creative scenario, but only using uh, digital technologies. And I think Zoom will help us now to inspire you uh, nearly 20 days, I think 15 to 20 days in a row, uh, you will be inspired. And we're going to inspire people from Kiev, from Espo, from Brussels. And after that, we're going to let you dive into a unique experience also to, to do an online hackathon uh, where we, we collaborate with some uh, partners in Finland that will really help us uh how to use technologies but still maintain the co-creative capacities uh, of a hackathon so that will be also i think something unique and then let's see that uh, the best in class from our different regions will have the opportunity later at the end of the year to showcase their projects at the, the virtual dutch design week and I guess some of you, if you're interested in design uh, and in creativity, you know what the Dutch Design Week means. It is one of the best uh, design weeks in the world. Uh, the, the city of Eindhoven, with its post-industrial character, has really developed over the years a fantastic um, uh, example of what a Dutch Design Week should be. Uh, and and, and I, I haven't seen so far in my life another region or city that has been able to encapsulate all that power and energy into a one week of, uh, of, of design uh, and creativity. So uh, hopefully we're going to enjoy something particular in the online version this year. But uh, once upon a time, when you have the opportunity, uh, go to the Dutch Design Week. Uh, I remember that last year, uh, a delegation from Kiev came to the Dutch Design Week to really discover how a city can really turn itself entirely into, a, into that atmosphere. So that's the experience we're going to uh, let you go through over the, the several months of this uh, ADU program. I'm, I'm honored to be the first speaker that will try to just inspire you a little bit with my expertise, my competences when dealing with creativity, innovation, entrepreneurship. And, um, and the title that I've chosen to open uh, a little bit the debates and the, the, the inspiration for you is to say, um, whatever you do, whatever you decide to do, if you tomorrow decide to start up your own activity uh, by creating your own project, or if you decide to innovate and to create something new in an existing company, because some of you might say, I, I will try tomorrow to innovate, but in an existing environment. Uh, a small, medium, or large organization. So whatever your, your, your journey will be, uh, I can only encourage you to, to do a bit of strategy uh, before, because although I like passion to guide us, or 
um, sometimes serendipity can guide us or sometimes intuition can guide us where we were saying like uh, I have the intuition that that this project could fly and could become a successful startup or ID. I think that uh, following a certain path, a certain methodology and a certain uh, using a certain number of tools might help you. Uh, and, and I think that's important because we all know that succeeding in the world today is not always that easy. Uh, when we come back to some statistics and, and figures, uh, I always underline the fact that it's only, it's less than 20% of people that succeed in, in their venture. So we rather try to follow a certain strategy and, and a certain path uh, because it's always more fun, I think, to succeed than to fail. Although failing is part of the learning curve and I think it's often so that out of a failure, you learn probably more than out, out of a success. But let's not be naive. I think that all of you uh, are looking to success and not to fail. So let's see if I can inspire you and help you and guide you a little bit today into this uh, uh, journey that brings you to success as an entrepreneur. I will start to share my screen. Uh, we have tested it before, it was working, so hopefully it works for you as well. I share the screen, I'm going to go through a couple of slides, uh, 20 to 25 slides, where I just explain you a little bit. On one hand, I still thought that it, it's useful to come back a little bit to my region, because uh, I hope that some of you might want to collaborate maybe today or later with some of the uh, the, Be the Brussels-based uh, creative people. So I still let you dive a little bit into Brussels uh, because I assume that not all of you have already been able to, to travel to Brussels. So that will be a couple of slides to, to really take you into that journey. And then I will take you throughout some slides also in this strategic level that uh, I invite everybody to, to apply when you want to become creative innovative uh, and when you want to uh, start your, your journey. So let's go and share the screen and, um, and let you discover what, uh, what I want to tell you. So I will just put it on the full mode. So I hope everybody sees the screen. Just put your thumb up if that's okay. The screen is okay for everybody. Yep, yep, okay, I see it already. Perfect. So let's um, go to, like I was saying, no creativity or innovation without a strategy. Uh, it's part of this first block. Eh? If you see the program, you have four different blocks and through each block, we try to bring you to some, to another level. So this first inspirational uh, um, keynote that I will give to you is still, I would say, an introduction to uh, uh, your in entrepreneurial journey uh, because the, the, the next speakers that will follow day after day will start to dive into much more detailed aspects and, and, and different concepts that you will uh, ideally use into your journey. So don't expect too deep, uh, a deep dive into the entrepreneurship. Just expect you to, to open a little bit your mind and hopefully help you to guide you already a little bit. Um, who am I as, a, as, a, as an entrepreneur? I'm, I'm using my title as being co-founder of this Brussels Creative. So Brussels Creative is a non-for-profit that uh, I created with some other people four years ago and I will explain you what it is all about. And then I like to describe myself more as somebody that is quite insatiable. Insatiable is a beautiful word because it, uh, for me, it is, it is something that, that is even beyond passion. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm still, even at 54, I continue to create companies, to create projects. Um, and, and I've learned over the time and over the years to sometimes say no to certain opportunities because that's what we have to learn. But uh, it is still difficult, to be honest. Uh, I prefer to say yes to an opportunity than no. Um, because this, yeah, this passion and this insatiable aspect of my character and personality um, yeah, gives me always 
uh, or push me always a little bit in the back to try to say yes. Serial creative entrepreneur, because I created uh, in, in a bit more than 30 years of career, I developed already over 30 companies, uh, non-for-profits and profit companies. That's what makes you at a certain time a serial entrepreneur. And today I continue to develop certain activities, um, but I'm also helping other entrepreneurs as mentor, as coach, we also invest, we are a couple of uh, business friends and we invest also in, uh, in some startups and companies that we try to group uh, under a certain umbrella. So helping and developing entrepreneurship in my own region, but also beyond that, beyond that region. Um, when we come back to the Brussels uh, creative uh, uh, non-for-profit, because I think that it might be helpful for you one day as an entrepreneur, if you want to develop yourself in another country or in another city you might want one day to to want to connect yourself with a region like brussels and what can brussels creative mean for you and why why did we create it and and we were doing the exercise a couple of years ago uh, about our vision and our mission because uh, it's still important again we talk about strategy um, why did we decide to create Brussels Creative and how do we see our vision and mission uh, over the, the years? And I think we, we all were recognizing that more and more um, the creative economy was indicated as the future engine of the European economy. And for very long, I think that uh, the creative economy, the, the creative and cultural industries, were rather seen as something, a very small industry, uh, grouped all together into one cluster. Uh, but in terms of GDP and ec economical value, we were never considered as one of the big ones. You would com compare us to the automotive industry or to the pharmaceutical industry or to the manufacturing industry. We are quite low in terms of GDP and in terms of employment. But what was important to see a couple of years ago is that more and more politicians, but also researchers and business people were starting to say that we, we were much more seen as a driver uh, and an engine of the future economy. And that's why taking that or getting those signs was one of the important first consideration is to say we, we need to grab, to grab that opportunity that there is a responsibility given to our economy that is saying you are the future engine of, uh, of the economy. Uh, because we are capable to think out of the box, to, uh, to be disruptive, uh, that's how we always have been operating. We are rather small and medium organizations, quite agile, quite creative, quite disruptive. And based on those techniques that we are used to develop, um, the, the indication was uh, you, you are the engine of that uh, economy. Um, we, we also um, believe very much in our vision that we should focus very much on the crossover of the different disciplines. I was touching on that yesterday at the introduction already, is that the more we, we are connecting different disciplines, the more the innovation will be, in our point of view, disruptive. So that was also part of our um, overall vision. It is to say we have a role to play in the future development of the economy. Uh, we are the people that are capable to think out of the box and we should promote uh, and develop the crossover uh, approach of the dis different disciplines. And when we translated that into our missions, <laughs> I, I told you that yesterday as well, it's about building bridges, so connect those different people in your region. It's about um, initiating a kind of culture, and it's not easy when you are trying to build bridges across the disciplines. I told you yesterday as well, it's not always that easy. Uh, when the first times I was creating meetings uh, for all these different people, they were looking at me and they were saying like, Alan, it's not easy today to initiate some discussions between a, fashion, between a fashion designer, a game developer, an architect, 
a politician and maybe a researcher. But the more you start to bring them together, the more little by little there, there, there is something happening that can be friendship, that can be trust, that can be curiosity towards each other. And that's how we develop a very creative ecosystem. And we believe that we can use, and that was our, one of our mission, use that ecosystem as a service. Uh, I put the words on the second bullet, E-A-A-S, it's ecosystem as a service. We should be able to promote that collective intelligence of our ecosystem that can be used as a service for our own region, but also for other regions when they want to connect with us. Um, we also needed for sure, as Brussels Creative, to identify new sources of revenues, because many, many of us, small, medium enterprises and startups in the creative economy, we have a lack often of uh, funding. And, and I will talk back about the, the notion of funding later. Um, and, and what, what is the right funding for a startup? But it is true that today, if you look in Kiev, in, if you look in Espo or in Brussels, we all we often uh, have a lack of European of funding, and that's why we need to look for local funds, European funds, and some investors and business angels. That was also like one of the missions that we had to de uh, deliver as Brussels Creative. That's why we are so eager to participate to European projects like the one in which we are connected today, the EDU program. Um, well, of course, the, the last uh, milestone of our mission was to build these bridges with other regions. And, and again, today it is the EDU program, but the last three, four years, we have been participating every year to European um, uh, consortium and European programs, uh, many of them as part of the Horizon 2020 program, but also Creative Europe and some other programs that are investing quite heavily in uh, our startup world. And where maybe 30 years ago, I was not looking to, to the European programs as a potential funding for my startups. I think now in the year 2020, each of you should really uh, think about Europe when you need to fund eventually your, your program because Europe is investing much more in it to its different regions and into the startup world. So this was for us uh, the definition of why we think uh, we had to create Brussels Creative. When, we, when you now would say like, hey, Alan, I don't know Brussels. I don't know what to expect uh, from Brussels. I will let you dive into the Brussels region through four or five different projects that are for me important landmarks and important places that might be useful for you uh, as an entrepreneur in Kiev or in Espo to be connected with. And I think each of our region, I've been visiting the last years a couple of times Espo, but also a couple of times Kiev. And I think we, we have to, we, we should connect with some places and people and projects in Kiev and Espo. But likewise, you should also know what Brussels can offer you as a region. Uh, and I know that delegations, well, uh, Kari, but also Yelena and Igor, have been uh, visiting uh, Brussels and Espo uh, the last years and discovered uh, how inspirational our different regions could be. And again, likewise, I was inspired by what, I, what I've seen in Kiev. I saw not only Unit City and, and all that new development that is for me a very uh, amazing landmark, of course, in Kiev, but I visited also different places in Kiev with a lot of inspirational people and, uh, and projects. Um, the creative economy, uh, to, to come back to that, because for me it's still important, sometimes people are saying, uh, who do you represent? Uh, is it the creative and cultural industries? You see here uh, a number of uh, 11 uh, different sectors, clusters, that are gathered in the CCI. Uh, the official name of our economy is the creative and cultural industries. I don't like it too much. I prefer always to talk about the creative economy because I think that creative people can be found in many different industries. You can find a creative person in the pharmaceutical sector. You can find a creative person in the food industry. 
and you can find creative people in our world of advertising, technology, uh, architecture and fashion. So I prefer to say that the, what binds us is the creativity uh, rather than a cluster type of uh, approach to uh, who we are. And in my members of Brussels Creative, I have people that represent the, the government, the industry, the citizens, but also the academical world, the universities and business schools. And I think that that multiple helix is for me still uh, important to let them collaborate in Kiev Expo in Brussels to foster that innovation and to foster that creativity. So these are the basic principles behind Brussels Creative, but also I think behind our personal belief as co-founders of Brussels Creative. And I must say that every time that we meet with other regions all over Europe, um, uh, we, we have been not only connecting ourselves with Espo and Kiev, but also with regions like Aarhus, like Eindhoven, like, uh, like um, Leipzig in Germany or like Barcelona in Spain. And every time you go to these regions, you can find similar, uh, similar thoughts animating the local ecosystems uh, that, uh, that we represent. Uh, one, one landmark that I just wanted to showcase you a little bit on the slides, it's called Tour and Taxis. And Tour and Taxis is a project that you can compare in size with uh, what has been developed um, in, in Kiev with Unit City. It is a very large post-industrial site, uh, close to 30 hectares uh, large, that has been uh, developed by private funding mainly, a little bit public funding, but mainly private funding, and that declared that entire environment where you will have businesses, citizens, research centers, and um, uh, uh, public institutions living together, nearly like a city in the city. It's nearly like a city in the city. Uh, uh, try to go online, try to look a little bit later because the slides will be available on the, on the platform uh, after the, the presentation. So you can find everything back there. But uh, go and look around on Tour and Taxi, what uh, they are developing today. Uh, Cross-disciplinary, uh, you can find their fab labs, you can find several um, uh, training centers, you can find several creative companies, you can find places to meet, to, to create together, to develop, you can find investment funds. So it's like... A, 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 a small city in the city dedicated to innovation and creativity. Amazing place, very inspiring. Uh, people from Kiev and people from Espo visited it already in the past and they were all uh, quite amazed about the size of it, but also the, the opportunities that it can offer to you. So if you're an entrepreneur of Kiev, you want tomorrow to be connected with a creative uh, and innovative place somewhere else, you can easily connect yourself with uh, the people of uh, uh, Tour and Taxi, where opportunities of incubation, co-working, and many other aspects are presented to, uh, to people that uh, are, are entrepreneurs like, uh, like you are. So one interesting landmark, certainly valuable to uh, explore, and all dedicated to innovation and creativity. Because I think that's also what is happening in many cities, and look to your own a unit uh, city uh, project in Kiev. It is also entirely dedicated to entrepreneurship, innovation, and creativity. So very similar. And unit city and touring taxi management met each other already also, because it's it's uh, it's interesting to connect those places uh, throughout Europe. Because once your startup ID will grow, you will want to scale up your ID. And scaling up means often that you need to be connected with other places. I'm looking to the timing because we started a bit late, so I need to wrap up a, a bit faster. Another very interesting uh, project that I would invite you also to discover and to get inspired by, it's all the development of uh, urban farming, bringing back local production, bringing back uh, farming into the cities, is one of the major challenges that we will have all over Europe and all over the world. And the team of Steve Beckers that you see on the right of the slide has developed 
a quite unique place, uh, over one hectare of greenhouses, uh, but also be behind the greenhouses, all the technology of circular economy, circular energy, Aquapony. Aquapony is a way how to cultivate your urban farm by using, on one hand, fish, and the fish that uh, can also later on be distributed locally in your region. So it brings back the fish into the cities and it combines the, the, the cultivation of fish and the cultivation of vegetables in your, in your uh, region. When you see the size again of uh, this project, uh, we talk about a total area again of 20 to 30 hectares uh, in which one hectare is now devoted and dedicated to the urban farm. Very inspiring, you type B-I-G-H, Brussels or Urban Farm Brussels and you will find it. Very inspiring if some of you one day are uh, wanting to develop some activities in, in more the, the urban and circular economy, take contact with them. Steve Beckers is one of the top experts in, in Europe. Uh, CU Square. CU Square is a place, again, when you see the size of it, uh, many post-industrial uh, places in Brussels were abundant and uh, more and more you see that public and private collaboration are um, investing into these places and trying to give them a new meaning, to revitalize it with a new meaning. Uh, a meaning that can have an impact, not only economically, but also socially and, society, and for the society. And this one has been um, invested by the two main universities of Brussels that are called VUB and ULB. They together decided to invest private and public money into the revitalization of this uh, uh, area, uh, in which uh, you see some vague pictures yet but they, they will develop incubation center. There is already a fab lab that is present. There will be some uh, facilities for students to live there so that you are living amongst other students, but also in an uh, environment where entrepreneurship is stimulated. You have fab labs, you have maker spaces. We organized at the end of last year, the first maker uh, fair for Brussels in uh, this area that was also very crowded like you can see we will still be able to uh, connect with each other in a crowded area uh, but so uh, a maker fair also very useful to develop this uh, this kind of movement of or, or to give a place for all the movement of makers to be connected in one place so the universities invest uh, the first example was a private investment the second example uh, brought us to this uh, urban farm this is more like a, a place where the universities are trying to reinvent themselves and to connect themselves with, uh, with the entrepreneurship. Another very interesting place, and although I don't show too much the place, I, I, I show you the two founders, uh, a man and a girl, Ibrahim and Julie, uh, created uh, Molen Geek. Uh, and Molen Geek is a coding school, an inclusive coding school for um, for young, young people uh, or anybody, I would say, in, in the city that finds that he, he should be like more educated in, in the digital landscape, he can go there and be trained on coding and on other uh, uh, hard skills that you, sh you, you should have if you want to be future-proof in 2020 in Brussels. You see that people like Macron, our king, or even the CEO of Google, were visiting him the last months because it's very impressive how he has been able to inspire um, many, many uh, uh, young people from immigrant background because uh, uh, Ibrahim is uh, himself from Moroccan background or roots. And he has been able to, to function as a role model for many, many young people that were not uh, that had not a clear picture maybe on where to go in their future career and they managed to uh, be inspired and be trained by uh, Ibrahim and his team. So very fabulous project as well, Molen Geek. Media Park, uh, it's a cluster organization. In next week, I think Marlon uh, will be one of the experts talking about the power of ecosystems and clusters. She has been making a huge study on this one, so I'm sure she will talk to you about that. Uh, but it's, uh, it's the cluster of the media industry 
that will be brought uh, together into one and another enormous uh, uh, place where public and private funds uh, have, have been invested in and they will try to bring together all the media sector uh, in one place. So you see there as well how people are trying to develop either cluster, uh, cluster uh, initiatives like the media uh, or may a more a thematic one like creativity and innovation if we talk about the first example of uh, tour and taxi. Be central, uh, what you see as a picture is, uh, is the, the, the main central station in Brussels. Uh, where at the at the main floor and the, the ground floor and the, the, the and and the, the underground is dedicated to trains and metros, but all the, the the top part that were for long offices for the train station uh, uh, company uh, were were also like revitalized by putting there um, uh, a coding again a coding initiative. I think that many of us needs to. Um, needs to challenge uh, uh, its competences in terms of hard skills and soft skills and the coding is certainly something that we see that the society needs much more and they have been opening B centrals in more than 15 places in Belgium already but this one was the first one in Brussels and then to finish on my my ecosystem or my region uh, we have uh, identified in our region over 750 places, projects and communities that are all trying to, to help to foster innovation and creativity in our region. I think somebody is not on mute, so we should make sure that people put themselves on mute when they don't need to talk. If you have a question, you can always, but if not, make sure you put yourself on mute. And maybe, yeah, so that's done. So we have identified over 750 different places that are also part of this uh, huge ecosystem that uh, Brussels creativity represents. And I've put a few names here. Um, we have one place that is dedicated to the, the, the fashion industry that is called MAT. We have one place that is uh, dedicated to street art that is called Strokar. We have um, a, a huge other place that is called Brut Canal. I will give all the names where it's more a place for uh, the, the artistic sector. So each of us has a little bit their own like uh, DNA and, and its own theme or approach into it. My, my own place that I created uh, more than 10 years ago is also on the bottom right of the slide. It's called the Egg uh, and there in the Egg as well, we try to incubate and help young companies and starters to develop themselves. So that's like where, where I, I still believe that um, if we come back to the, the, the theme of tonight, uh, having a strategy for your innovation and creativity is important, but having an ecosystem is also very important because starting up a project alone in Kiev without being connected in a network or in an ecosystem of entrepreneurship might be very scary and very delicate or risky uh, as a journey. And that's why I think you should also when you start up your project, make sure that you are connecting yourself with a network of um, people around you that are probably closely connected with your project on which you can rely. You can rely for additional expertise, you can rely uh, eventually for coaching uh, needs, or you can rely on for additional funding perspective if you need. So, the ecosystem is really for me something fundamental for you as an entrepreneur that was not existing 30 years ago, that exists today in each region in the world. So make sure that you connect yourself with uh, your, your local uh, Kiev ecosystem. No creativity or innovation without a strategy. Um, I think that as a startup, uh, and I will, I will explain one example that for me shows very well what your strategy should, should be as, a, as an entrepreneur, as a startup, and not as an intrapreneur. And the intrapreneur is somebody that develops creativity and innovation in an existing company. But when you want to start from scratch uh, um, a company, uh, I think it's important that you understand that there is, there is a process behind, and that process should lead you also to make sure that you keep your focus on a certain strategy. Uh, and I will give you an example from our, our Brussels region. 
that for me was one of the most beautiful and inspiring examples of um, entrepreneurship with a vision and with a certain strategy. The, the, the journey that I still explain to, to many people and that I, I continue to hammer very much on, because I think it's, it's for you the way to success, it is that in your journey, make sure that you understand properly what those four steps are. And the first step um, after, after the moment that you have decided to collaborate with, uh, with a T, because I think being an entrepreneur is also being connected with a team. And so you can be two, three, four, or five different entrepreneurs that are deciding to unite their destiny and try to invest into a new project. But once that is done, make sure that you understand and that you practice very deeply, very hard, or that you find a coach or that you find an organization that are capable to help you uh, to, to dive deeper into the design thinking process. And the design thinking process, why for me it is so important, because it tells you and it teach you to focus on one thing uh, in your startup ID, it is on the customer. Without customers, and, and, and I can guarantee you that still now in 2020, despite the fact that we have more than 10, 15 years of many, many startups behind us in Europe, we still continue to see that one of the main failure, reasons to fail from many startups in the world is still that there was no markets. You as an entrepreneur, you're enthusiastic, you're passionate, you think you have a great idea, and I say the only person that can tell you if your idea is great is the customer. It is a B2B, it's a B2C, but there is a customer out there, a company or a consumer that needs to validate that your great idea is a great idea. And too often we see people driven by passion, driven by self-conviction, and then once they go to the market, they fail to develop their activity because there was no demand for that market. So design thinking, there is an entire process. Make sure that during this month, but also the next months, you become more, more familiar with the design thinking process, but make sure that in that process, you remember one thing, I need to focus on the customer. That's my only strategy, focus on the customer focus on the customer pain or the customer gain that you are generating and creating. There are thousands of opportunities out there to create a successful startup, to create a new company, but the only, uh, the, the only thing that matters for you in this phase of startup, uh, we are talking about a phase of six, nine months to 12 months maximum. During that period, you are in a startup phase uh, where the only thing that matters is that you try to make sure that the hypothesis that you have in your mind, that you have in your head, uh, are validated by the customer and the consumer. And the second step for me that is also still very, very important that should nurture your strategy is that you all become experts in the business model canvas because once you can answer properly to the nine blocks of your business model canvas, I think you will become a more mature starter uh, that has done the business, uh, the design thinking process first, that has gone through the business model canvas. It's a very basic tool, it's a very simple tool, but I think it's still so valid, so strong as a canvas that you, you should be, be able to uh, use as a way to guide yourself into your startup process. The third step is a, a tool, by the way, that we as entrepreneurs, we developed uh, ourselves se seven years ago. It is used worldwide in, um, in over 80 business schools, universities, and many incubation centers. Uh, we have over 100,000 users on the platform. Uh, and what it is, it creates a map that assesses the maturity of uh, your business model canvas. And so that's why the steps are so important. Step one, once you have your theme, once you have your, your domain in which you want to uh, develop something, once you have that, follow the different steps. I, 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 I spend some time and some weeks and months if necessary in the design thinking process where I know that I focus 
as much as I can on the customer and his pain and to see how I can solve that pain on the most innovative and disruptive way, making sure that I am different from the competition that is always out there. Competition, there is always. You will never be alone on the market. Second step, you make sure that you answer all the different steps from the business model canvas. And the third step is you assess the maturity of your canvas by filling in your pimento map. And that pimento map, you use it to try to uh, work on the weaknesses and the things to improve that are often highlighted with red and orange colors. But you try to work on your weaknesses and the things to improve, ensuring that once you will turn from the startup to a company phase, that you have strong foundations for your company and that you can hopefully go towards success. And the last step, I think, is everything that Steve Blank has learned us as um, uh, the Lean Startup methodology. Try to also read the book, uh, find some inspirational tutorials uh, on, on, uh, online. I will all put them after my presentation on the Moodle platform so that you can find back everything. But try to make sure that you are inspired by what Steve Blank is bringing us. The example I wanted to use, and you can maybe laugh and say this is typically Belgium again because they're back talking about their beer. But uh, yeah, it is a, a beautiful um, startup that uh, has now come to the face to become a scale-up. But the last five to six years, the beer project was launched by initially two founders that were on one hand that were um, connected or lovers of the beer sector in general. So they had a, a certain affinity with beer. Uh, not that they were drunken sailors, but they were, they were connected in their past career with the beer sector. So they had quite some no hope. And they were also fascinated about the startup world and the logistics behind the development of, uh, of a beer. And what they did uh, in, their, in their different phases of the startup development is that they were one, uh, in, in the beginning, they said, like, we have identified when we talked to people in the Brussels region that many of them were complaining that there were no local Brussels beers produced anymore. Many of the beers that were Brussels once upon a time in their history were, had, had been taken over by some uh, uh, big companies and you didn't have local produced Brussels beer anymore. So they went to different terraces uh, of uh, bars in the city and they were really literally doing, and you must imagine that like five, six years ago, they were literally going to the terraces with the blind testing, saying we have uh, three different beers uh, blindly here uh, in a bag. We would like you to test it, to taste it, and to tell us which is the one that you would prefer. What are the ingredients that you prefer? And based on a tour amongst more than 1,000 consumers during several weeks in Brussels, they came out with the choice of Brussels. The Brussels consumers were choosing the flavor that they liked the most. They went back after that first round of co-creation with the consumer, design thinking, the customer be connected with them, co-develop and co-create with the customer. They went back to all the consumers and they said, based on what you have chosen, we, we have several uh, logos and colors that we would like to use as well as names for that potential beer. They came back and after a, a round of several weeks, they came back with the, the choice of Brussels for the first name for the first beer with the colors of the logo and, the, and, and, and all the creative uh, concept of uh, the logo uh, was created to, together with the consumer. Then they said to the consumer that they would look to produce in, in a certain volume, this new beer for Brussels and get it distributed in the bars where they went for the blind testing and also in a limited number of retail stores. Uh, but they needed money for that. Uh, they couldn't uh, themselves uh, pro um, develop and acquire a brewery. Uh, so they had a great other idea how to get to their production needs. And they went to several uh, brewers in the neighborhood of Brussels and they were buying 
some percentage of their production lines because any brewer will always have certain moments in the production that is lower uh, and when they still have some over capacity to be able to produce some beer. So they were buying in several uh, uh, breweries the capacity they needed in the lines to be able to produce a certain first volume of some thousands of uh, liters. It was not yet the, the ten thousands of hectoliters, but little by little they started to produce some liters of that first beer co-created with the consumer and they were asking to the consumer uh, for a crowdfunding campaign to help them to set up the first marketing and retail distribution activities that they needed after the, the, the funding of the production. They managed to get, uh, I think, something like 30 to 35,000 euros as a uh, true a crowdfunding campaign, plus a little bit of own money and some funny, uh, money that they lent from a family, because often that's what is happening in the beginning of your startup phase. We, we often refer to the family, fools and friends. So they managed to gather that money. Uh, and with that money, they, they managed to create the first production. And then what they decided to control themselves as well was the distribution. Choosing the cafes and the bars where they could be uh, um, both or where, where the product was sold and also some very specific retail stores, uh, smaller stores that they had chosen themselves as well. And I think when you imagine uh, how, how big the Belgian beer, beer world is and was six years ago, and still be capable to build a success story like the, Bel the, the Brussels Beer Project have been able to do, for me is quite amazing. And it shows you can still develop successful activities even in a very traditional and very competitive market, as long as you come up with something different. And they managed to be very closely working with the consumer, with the Brussels-based uh, consumers. And with them, over the years now, they have more than 10 different uh, brands. They have developed a huge capacity or a huge network of retail stores and bars in Brussels. And guess what? This year, just one, two months ago, uh, just uh, during even the COVID-19 lockdown, they managed to convince some investors, public and private, to, lend, uh, to, to give them a loan of 6 million euros to develop their own brewery. Because they think now that they are at a certain scale and maturity of development after six, seven years that now they should be able to turn themselves into a, an own brewer capacity as well, but they still continue to combine the two worlds, buying some production capacities from existing brewers, but also starting tomorrow to become an, an own brewer as well. And again, for me, wow, uh, what a great um, uh, adventure or journey for, for these uh, two guys. What a great success. They have followed for me exactly all the different steps um, of the, the, the startup journey or of the, the, the entrepreneur with one main focus. And I think that's why I like the example. It is an, an obsession really uh, and focus on the consumer and, and, and the connection, the co-creation with the consumer has been central in the success of their story. So I like to share this one. I just, uh, because I, I know it is less uh, the matter, it's also already five minutes past six, so I will not uh, um, um, like use too much of your time. But uh, the, the other example that I, li I like a little bit to highlight as well, although it is uh, less uh, connected with uh, our EDU program, is tomorrow some of you might also decide to become more intrapreneurial uh, into uh, your own existing company because I still believe that many of us will not become start startupers and, and entrepreneurs, but I think many of us will continue to work in large companies, but bring that entrepreneurial spirit into the company. Use the same tools, by the way. You use your design thinking, you use your business model canvas in an existing big company, but there the strategy is not starting from scratch. I think the strategy remains important that we stay connected with the customer and the consumer, but we, we have a legacy. We have something that exists already. So you don't start with a blank sheet. You start already with an existing organization. And there you need to understand 
where you can where you can develop innovation and creativity and what is the the playground in which you you, you play and that's why i like to refer and also there try to to look up some information i will share it on the moodle platform after but try to make sure that you investigate deeper in, an, in a fantastic theory uh, that is called the job to be done. It, uh, it, it has been teached for many, many years and, and there are beautiful books uh, that are available uh, as well. It has been teached by um, uh, Professor Clayton Christensen that, is, uh, that was teaching at the Harvard Business School. That is uh, an amazing uh, professor that came up with a very interesting theory to help to develop a kind of compass for innovation for uh, corporate companies and for companies that want to invest more into innovation that helps them also to react better to understand better what disruption means to observe where innovation emerges into your industry and how you should react to all the different types of innovation that uh, can appear in your industry um, I, I give also like one example uh, to also understand sometimes um, uh, how it can help uh, companies to, to remain successful after so many years. Everybody knows IKEA. Uh, everybody knows how successful that company has been uh, driven for so many years by its founder. And we often say that what he had clearly in his mind and what was absolutely clear for the founder was uh, to have a, a picture of what the job to be done is from IKEA why are people going to ikea and what makes them so different and by the way so successful compared to many other stores that exist out there i think that the the the, the, the industry of furnishment uh, home furnishment is quite home and office it's a bit uh, a mixture of the two but i think it's mainly the home furnishment market is quite huge there are many different players in the world but um, he, he, he managed to stay unique and so successful because he managed to define properly with his teams and with his strategy team to define the job to be done uh, of uh, the IKEA brand. And the job to be done that he defined was, I need to be, for my mainstream customers, the only place where I can in one journey furnish my entire apartment or home into uh, one day. So it is, the components are important. I can go to one place and in one day I can furnish the entire apartment or home and offer for, we would say, young people. It is either the young people that are student and want to become independent or it's your first home. Although I see today that even older people go there sometimes to furnish the entire uh, environment that uh, they, are, they are moving to. And that definition of your job to be done should be the main compass of all your innovation activities uh, that you um, encourage your teams and your people to come up with. And it might still be a bit abstract for many of you. I cannot dive deeply into it, but try to look online to inspiration. If you want to innovate in your company, you should be able to ask to your CEO, do we have a clear picture of what the job to be done is from our company? And for the job to be done, again, you need to put yourself in the customer shoes, what is very difficult for many people. Many of my clients in the banking sector, in the manufacturing sector, they have huge difficulties to define precisely what the job to be done is of their company. Because they always are more tempted to talk from the inside to out. And we say in this exercise, it is important to put yourself in the customer shoes and to define clearly why that customer is coming to you. What is the job he wants to buy from you? Once you have a clear picture of that, it should drive all type of innovation. And it allows you to say sometimes to some of your teams, we will not develop that project or we will develop that one. Why? Because it fits or not in the job to be done strategy uh, um, for innovation in, in your company. It's a, it's a quick dive into uh, that aspect. I don't want to, to, uh, to, to go too more into depth because it could take us for days and days, but it's a fascinating also other part of what I think we should all learn about. We, we, we will become intrapreneurs or entrepreneurs 
although the EDU program is more dealing with the entrepreneurship. Um, I could only like um, share a little bit like an hour and like we often say we could spend uh, hours and days together on, on the Zoom or face to face. If you if you have questions about what you have heard and seen during my uh, uh, keynote, um, you can always, on one hand, I will put some um, files and videos uh, on the platform so that you can dive back into it later, but never hesitate. You can, of course, find me back on uh, LinkedIn. You can also find me back on, on my mail. Uh, I share with you some interesting books that I, I still think that in 2020, many of you should be reading because inspirational at many levels, uh, inspirational for HR, inspirational for understanding where we are in the society, understanding how companies are changing the way that they are managed, how leadership is changing, how innovation should be back in the core of our companies um, starting up or existing companies. They should much more make sure that innovation comes back to the the, the core uh, of, uh, of their strategy. So this, is, this was a bit the story I wanted to share you with. I hope you enjoyed it. It's the first one. We're going to have 15 to 20 more during the month of uh, June and July. Uh, get yourself inspired. Get yourself ready. Try to challenge yourself and your ideas, but uh, make sure that you, you use the process uh, that, that uh, I have designed here uh, in front of you or explained and make sure that you are more than ever customer and consumer centric because that's the only thing that matters in uh, this phase of your journey. Thank you very much. I will stop sharing, come back to the Zoom platform with the video and see if any of you uh, might have questions. If you have so, don't hesitate. If you don't have, we will see uh, what Olga is suggesting us, but I see you all back on the screen. So I see that most of you are still alive. You're still there. I hope still a bit smiling and inspired. Um, it was a monologue, but that's what inspiration is about. We cannot uh, interact too much, but if you want, we still have a bit of time. If you have questions, ID, or if you disagree with some things that you heard, Please shoot. Um, I put myself on mute and I listen to eventual questions. 